Okay. <clears throat> I've been given the thumbs up, so I'm going to start. I am Martel Winters with Nelson Laboratories, and I'm talking a little bit about uh, current innovations with radiation sterilization. For quite a few years, radiation sterilization had been a little bit stagnant. We'd kind of been doing the same thing for a long time. Uh, but in the, last, in the last handful of years, we've had a, a good number of changes. And especially in the last couple of years, we're seeing uh, some n interesting new opportunities coming up. So I'm just going to go through some of these. I only have, I think, 12 or 13 slides. And so hopefully there'll be time for questions after, if you'd like. Uh, the first is radiation of tissue, biologics, or combination products. And this is becoming more of a common opportunity. We're seeing situations with, uh, with these types of products where uh, either heat or, or uh, steam is damaging to the products, and so radiation is a good alternative. In most cases, with these products, you're usually looking for as low of a sterilization dose as possible. So there are a few options now. The VDMAX 15, so to validate a 15 kilogray sterilization dose, has been, has been available now for several years. Uh, method 1 has always been able to go down to 11 kilogray for sterilization dose. And with method 2A and 2B, you can get down to about 11 kilogray and 8 kilogray, respectively. So there are already options available to get nice low sterilization doses. Uh, they also are usually looking for smaller sample sizes because uh, large quantities of samples are usually not available. So VDMAX is appealing because the sterility, the sterility test performed for VDMAX is only a 10 sample sterility test as opposed to the 100 sample test, which is the case with method one and method two. Uh, there's a modified method two, which has also been available for quite some time for, through uh, Amy TIR 20. Method two can provide you with the, the lowest sterilization dose possible. The problem is you burn up between five and 600 samples in that test. And Amy TIR 40 provides a rationale for how to establish a sterilization dose using method two and cut that sample size about in half. So it still is a larger sample size, but it, it still helps. And then Amy TIR 35 has information for method one and method two for how to reduce that sample size for the sterility test of 100 down to different levels, either 70 or even as low as 35 if you pass a specific qualification test. So that means for method one or method two for dose audits, you could do a sterility test of 35 samples instead of 100. Uh, and then also with regards to tissue and biologics, uh, Amy did develop a specific document for these types of products. It's Amy TIR 37, which provides guidance on irradiation of tissue and biologics products. Uh, one thing that we have to look at for uh, radiation sterilization of, of these products is often the testing has to be done differently. In a bioburden test, oftentimes you need to be as sensitive as possible and a normal extraction and filtration type of test might not be the best approach to take. So we're often looking at MPN, which stands for most probable number, or pooling. And uh, also, uh, pooling of samples, meaning instead of testing 10 samples separately, you might pool more than 10 samples together into one test. So when you divide it out, you end up with a result, which is, which is either one, you know, you can resolve down to one CFU or even less than one CFU. And the lower the sterilization dose, the more sensitive your bioburden test method needs to be. And so often, these types of, uh, of approaches need to be considered. And we also often need to evaluate the bioburden results differently, where typically, if you are, let's say, in a bioburden test, if you're immersing the product in 300 milliliters of solution and you're filtering 100 milliliters, you have a factor of three because you've only filtered one third. You've only tested one third of your solution. And uh, usually that is recorded or recorded as less than three. And, and then the, the number of three is used in calculating your averages. But uh, where you're trying to, where you need to get nice low numbers for bioburden, you might need to evaluate those results differently. 
John Kowalski and a, a couple of others recently published a really nice paper on, and, on how to statistically evaluate uh, bioburden results when you have less than numbers. So you're not, you're not defaulting to the, to, the, to the less than number as your bioburden average. And in sterility testing with these types of products, we often have to add neutralizers into the sterility media so that we're not getting false negative results. This is especially the case with antibiotics, which are frequently used on tissue, or uh, which are sometimes used as coatings on combination products. Now, uh, sometimes for these types of products, uh, concepts from the pharmaceutical industry are becoming more applicable. Uh, where you need to get a nice low dose and you have to be able to demonstrate a nice low bio burden, then concepts such as product or pro process characterization or process simulation or process validation become more important so that you are ensuring as much as possible that your manufacturing process is adding as little as possible to the product when it comes to bio burden. So switching now to uh, more general uh, sterile radiation topics, uh, we had discussions at the, at the AMI meetings just last month regarding a VDMAX table for 11 kilogray and for 12 and a half kilogray. And the, uh, so the, the VDMAX, the, the nice thing again about VDMAX is the very low sample size for sterility testing. So with VDMAX for 11, your bio burden has to be at or below 0.1 CFU average per product. And so that means, so that's why you have to employ these more sensitive bio burden methods. Now at a bio burden of 0.1 CFU, that corresponds to an SAL of 10 to the minus one, which means you already have your correct SAL for the sterility test, which means if you've demonstrated a bio burden of 0.1 CFU on your product, then your verification dose is zero kilogray, meaning you perform a sterility test on products which have not been irradiated. And now this is already the case in, uh, with method one and with other VDMAX doses where you demonstrate a bio burden of 0.1 CFU. <coughs> Sorry. Um, for my, method one, I have to be a modified method one to have a, a verification dose of zero. So with VDMAX doses, though, where you, in method one, you're testing 100 samples. With VDMAX, we're testing 10 samples. If you prove 10 of them, or if you prove 0.1 CFU on your product, then your verification dose is zero kilogray. And a zero kilogray verification dose will become more common as more of these products start leaning towards irradiation. ISO 13004 has been published now, which has the VDMAX uh, with all of the other sterilization doses between 15 and 35 kilogray. So that is a nice benefit. It's been available in the U.S. since 2005, and we finally got this set up, uh, finally got it through ISO as a, as a uh, technical specification. Um, with uh, one benefit to method one has been that if 10 to the minus six is not necessarily applicable for your product, maybe it's a topical product, or if your product cannot, cannot handle 10 to the minus six sterilization doses, with method one, the table includes SAL values that range from 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus six. Now, in, uh, in the, again, in the Amy meetings last month, we did talk about compiling a VD max option with these other SALs. So then with VDMAX, with the smaller sample size of 10 samples for sterility, you would be able to determine a sterilization dose for 10 to the minus 3, minus 4, or minus 5. We also talked about uh, developing tables using populations A and populations B. Uh, population C is the current population of microorganisms that were used to create the method 1 and the, meth and the uh, VDMAX tables. And the, the population C assumes a certain percentage of highly resistant microorganisms. And populations A and B do not assume quite that same high level of, uh, of resistant microorganisms. So 
if you would, if you want to consider even a lower sterilization dose than what is currently allowable in method one or in VD Max, then you could consider a VD Max table using population A or B and get even a lower sterilization dose. You would just have to prove that the microorganisms on your product that, that their resistance to radiation is lower than population C. So there would be separate tables for population A, B, or C, and you would select which one you, you want to compare yourself against. There's been a, an ongoing discussion on SAL, on sterility assurance level. Uh, 10 to the minus 6, that, that 10 to the minus 6 value that we have pointed to forever is not based on science. There is no, there was never a study that proved that 10 to the minus 6 was required to protect the patients from getting an infection. So uh, the discussion we've been having on 10 to the minus 6 is related to the, uh, the concept of uh, what SALs are appropriate to, to still keep the patients safe, but to allow us more flexibility with sterilization for these innovative products that might not be able to handle a traditional sterilization dose or a traditional SAL. So uh, there have been a couple of papers and numerous discussions on SAL and the impact to patient. Uh, there is one uh, which, is, which came out in 2012 uh, from Solpex Srun and some others uh, last year, and there's another one coming out in the next month or two in, uh, in uh, Amy's journal, Biomedical Instrumentation and Technology, a follow-up to, uh, to that same discussion. And uh, both of these papers demonstrate that generally there is, there is zero impact to the patient until you get, until you get uh, less stringent than 10 to the minus 4. So it's not until you hit about 10 to the minus 3 in most circumstances where you start to see an impact, a potential impact to the patient. And even then the impact is extremely minimal. So depending on risk and benefit to the patient, then even something less stringent than 10 to the minus 4 might be appropriate. Now, ST67 has provided alternatives to 10 to the minus 6 since, 10, since 2003. That has always been an option, and FDA has, has, been, uh, has been on board with that approach. There's a new revision that we just finished in, in 2011, and it makes use of alternative SALs even easier. There's a flow chart in there that explains what things you should do to rationalize an SAL other than 10 to the minus 6. <clears throat> and last year, in 2012, there was an ISO meeting where in that discussion, a small group uh, from, selected from the ISO radiation working group was selected to determine the need for an international document on SAL. Right now, there are two documents on SAL. There's a European document, which is EN 556, and there is an AMI, a US document, which is AMI ST67. But right now, there is no international standardized document. That, that evaluation is still ongoing. It has not yet been decided that we need to develop an ISO document on SAL. But uh, so we have yet, we just need to wait and see if there is a, a need to develop that type, of, that type of document. OK, that is, uh, that's all I had. OK, thank you for your time.